All right, well, I'm gonna have you do something that I typically do not have you do. So, I want you to pull out your phones right now. Oh, I don't have Whoa, I want you, if you have a phone, if you have a phone, I want you to pull it out right now. This is like the one time that I let you do it. The other times you're like sneaking it from me. No, I know you still do it. You don't care what I say, but no, okay. I'm just kidding. Okay, so pull out your phone. I want you to go to Google and I want you to type in, I want you to type in the Baskin Robbins logo. The ba you're gonna waste your screen time right now on a sermon. How about that? All right. You look up Baskin Robbins. I, I, do I don't know if you guys have seen. I don't know if you guys have seen that before. You have. Do you see the the hidden message in some of these logos, like, like Thirty One Flavors? Now I want you to look up the Tostitos logo. Tostitos. Tostitos. Look at the Tostitos logo. Do you see the little guy dipping his chip? in the little salsa. Oh. Now I want you to, I want you to go look up the FedEx logo. FedEx. Do you see the arrow? That's what they move stuff, so the arrow. Now I want you to look up, now I want you to look up the NBC logo, NBC. Just look at the NBC, have Christian show you what's on the NBC logo. A it's a peacock. I don't know if you see that little nose there. Now I want you to look up one you probably haven't noticed before. I want you to look up. I want you to look up the Beats logo. The Beats logo. The Beats logo. Do you see the the big the B? Okay, good job. You you can read. Now, do you notice? Do you notice that someone looking sideways and if they're wearing headphones? It's like a side profile of someone wearing headphones. Okay, unless you're Owen, you maybe have never seen that before. Now the last one, this one, unless you already know this, it might blow your mind. Look up the Amazon logo. Oh, yeah, yeah. The Amazon logo. Other than Noah, who's really, really cool, look at the Amazon logo. Do you see the little swoop? Not, normally we see that as like a smile, but Amazon has everything from A to Z, and so that's why it's the A to the Z. They have everything. Whoa. Dude, he's at... He, Back at him with it, Bezos. So all these logos, they put these little, these little Easter eggs almost. They put these Easter eggs in these logos and they have some hidden messages in them. And maybe you, you've looked at the Amazon logo your whole life, but you've never noticed the little A to Z thing that they got going on here. But I guarantee you now, when you see these logos, you know, on the side of trucks or buildings or something like that, you're going to see them differently because you see the hidden message that's behind them. And see, in our study tonight through the book of Esther, the book of Esther is one of those, kind of like one of those logos where maybe you, when you initially look at it, you don't notice anything necessarily special. But if you look deeper, if you look, if someone is there to help you see into the book of Esther, we can't help but see God. And so Esther, it's a really interesting book. So I would love for you guys to open up to the book of Esther. It's a very interesting book because it's one of two books in the whole Bible that doesn't use God's name, which that is very interesting if you think about it. The word God, or even a reference to God, is not found in the book of Esther, which is kind of, a, kind of an interesting thing. It's kind of like one of these logos that maybe you look at it initially and you don't see God because his name is nowhere in this book. But as we're going to see tonight, as, our, as we uh, open it up and study it together, we're going to see that really God is on every single page. God is really in every single verse. Hopefully, when you leave tonight, you will, you will never see, you'll never read the book of Esther the same because God is really on every page, even though his name is not mentioned. It's going to teach us about life, and it's going to teach us really about how God is on every page, if you will, of your life, even if you don't necessarily see it right away. God is behind everything. God is, is working behind the scenes at all times. So let's look at the book of Esther. We don't have time to read the whole book. It's 10 chapters long, but I want us to briefly go over the story because it's really important. We're going to be hopping into chapter 9 and 10 together, but before we get there, it's one of those stories you just can't pick up halfway. You got to understand the whole story. So if you look at chapter 1 here, let's briefly go through the book together. Chapter 1, I'm not going to obviously read it for you, but we start in the land of Persia. We start in the land of Persia. And so this is after the, the Israelites had been exiled into Babylon. And so they were exiled into Babylon. And then Babylon was taken over by the Persians. And so now there were some Jews that were living in, in Persia. 
I know it's distracting. I know it's distracting, but I want you guys to pay attention. So we've got these Jews living in Persia, trying to obey God, trying to worship God in a foreign land. And so we have this king. You see this in verse 1, this guy named Ahasuerus. Maybe you've heard of him in your history books or something like that as King Xerxes. It's a lot easier to say King Xerxes, so that's what we're going to call him tonight. But he's this king who he gets really mad at his wife one night. And this is, first of all, this book is weird. It's got a lot of weird stuff, so it's not like when you read the Bible and you read someone does something that you can do it because it's in the Bible. This is one of those you have to be very thoughtful with. So we have the king here. He gets mad at his wife, so he basically divorces her because he uh, gets mad at her for not showing up to a party that he was throwing. And he says, okay, I want a new, I want a new wife. And so what he does, because he's the king, he makes every girl, unmarried girl in the region, at least, well, at least the prettiest girls in the region, show up to do a little beauty contest because he wants the hottest wife in the land. And so what he does is he does this little beauty pageant and we meet this girl named Esther. And so Esther, she was a Jew. And so she won this beauty pageant. She was made queen. And remember, she's a Jew married to this, this Persian king. We see this in chapter two. She becomes king. She's got this cousin named Mordecai. And Mordecai is, is one of the heroes of this story here. And so one day Mordecai, in the end of chapter two, you see at the end of chapter two there, Mordecai, he, he learns that someone is out to kill the king. And so what he does is he warns Esther because he knows her because she's his family. He warns Esther and the king finds out about these people that were trying to assassinate him. And then so the king is very happy. Chapter 3, we see this guy named Haman, this bad guy who basically starts to plan this uh, basically genocide of the Jews. And so we meet him in chapter 3. So now the Jews are in trouble, but remember, Esther is a Jew. And so what Esther and Mordecai, they make this plan together in chapter 4, where they decide to, to try to save the Jews. They try to put this plan together so that they can uh, fight this, this uh, decree here from this guy named Haman, who is a really important person in, in, the, in the Persian Empire here. And so Esther, she throws a couple of parties in chapter 5 and chapter 6. Um, and then basically, long story short, Esther, she is able to save the Jews from this genocide, from this Holocaust, basically. And so we see in a book where it has no mention of God in the book, we see God working to save his people. And I think that that's something for us to, to, to not only learn from, but to really understand that God is working every day. God is working at your school. God is working in your homes. God is working at our church. He's working in the background oftentimes. So I want us to not miss that because that's what we see really here in the book of Esther. So write it down this way for point number one. Don't miss God's work in the background. Don't miss God's work in the background. Throughout this book, God saves the people of Israel in the background. And then we get all the way to chapter 10 when Mordecai becomes this, this hero and hopefully you're reading along in our, in our uh, daily Bible reading. And so we're reading the book of Esther actually right now. And so you'll get the whole story in, in detail if you're reading with us. But basically, Esther and Mordecai, they save the Jews. They are Jews. They save the Jews. And then in chapter 10, we see Mordecai basically become the second in command to the king, to King Xerxes here. So go to chapter 10 here with me. Let's read it. It's actually just three verses long, but let's read chapter 10. This is the end of the story. This is after uh, Mordecai and, and Esther have saved the Jews. Esther chapter 10, just three verses long. Mordecai is now this hero. And it says, King Ahasuerus, or King Xerxes, he imposes tax on the land and the coastline and the sea. And all of his acts, both power and might, and full account of his honor of Mordecai, to which the king advanced him, are they not written in the book of Chronicles of the kings of Media and Persia? For Mordecai the Jew was second in rank to King Ahasuerus, and he was great among the Jews and popular with a multitude of all of his brothers, for he sought the welfare of his people and spoke peace to all of his people. And so we see God really be faithful to his people. If you think all the way back to the book of Genesis, God made this promise to Abraham, Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, and he says that he will bless all of those who bless Israel, and he will curse all of those who curse Israel. And so in this story, basically, God is, is fulfilling that promise he made to Abraham a long, long time before this story. God said he would be faithful to them. He would not let them be extinguished from the earth. And then he shows that here in the book 
of Esther. And if you could boil down to the book of Esther to one word, the word would be providence. So I want you to write that down, the word providence. Providence. That is ultimately the theme of this book here. The providence of God, you can think of it this way. It's God's all-wise and all-loving interaction with his people. God's all-wise and all-loving interaction with his people or with his creation. You think of the word providence, you also think of the word provide or provision. And we see that here in the book of Esther, God's provision for the people. He's in control of all things. He interacts with his creation. He does not just make creation. He doesn't just create the world and then leave the world by itself, but he's actively involved with the people of God. You can write down Psalm 33, Psalm 33, verse 13 through 15. Psalm 33, verse 13 through 15. You'll read it in our small, in your small group questions here in a couple minutes. But basically what the psalmist is here saying in this, in this uh, section here is that God sees everything and God interacts with everything. See, God sees every word that you say. God sees how you do your homework. God sees every test answer you put on your, your tests at school. God sees your relationship with your brother and sister. God sees what you do when no one else sees what you do. God knows those things, and so he's, he's all wise in that he, he sees it and he knows what's going to happen. And he also is there working behind the scenes in everything as well. He's involved and he provides for for his people. If you think every time you watch a movie, there are so many people involved in that movie. The people that you see are the actors and the actresses and you see them all nice with makeup, you know, good costumes and all that kind of stuff. They're looking great. Um, but what you don't see is you don't see the producers, you don't see the director, you don't see the stagehands, you don't see the makeup artists, you don't even really see the, the stunt devils or all of these people that make these movies what they are. But you see all of these people, the movie does not come together if all these people don't work together as one and they all work on this project for very long. And they show these credits at the end of every movie, which weird thing about Karina, fun fact about her is she has like a fear of watching credits of movies. Every time we watch a movie, she has to turn it off because she gets scared when she watches credits. I don't know why that's a thing, but she just doesn't like to give people the credit that they're due for making their movies. I don't know why um, I'm fine to watch the credits and say, oh, wow, look at that person. I Sometimes I'll like read their names. I'll be like, hey, you never, you know, you read this random name and you're like, oh, they, they made this movie happen. And all of these people, they get the credit. The people that are on the screen, that are right in front of you, and the people that are off the screen doing all the little things behind. And see, God's providence is God being like the actor and the actress, being the main characters in the story, but also being the makeup artist, also being the director, the producer, all of the people behind the scenes that we don't see. God's providence means that he is involved in everything. He's involved every time you hop in a car and drive to small groups. He's involved in every conversation. And see, maybe in school you learn about this, you you start talking about the, you know, the, the American fathers or something like that, um, the founding fathers rather, and, and you maybe learn this word in school, the word deism. I don't know if you've heard that before, deism. Deism, Deo is, is the word for God in, in Latin, and deism is this belief in God, but this belief in God that he basically sets the world into motion and then leaves it. Doesn't, doesn't interact with the world anymore. He sets it up. The, the, the common illustration is it's like a watchmaker who winds the watch, who makes the watch, and then just lets the watch run. And see, the, the God of the Bible here, the God of Esther here, he does not just make creation. He does not just create Adam and Eve and leave them to themselves, but he's always working in the background. And see, we're talking about providence here. Maybe you're sitting here and you're like, why, why does this matter? I don't really, I mean, cool. Yeah, God is involved in everything, but what does it matter for my life? But first of all, I, wa I, I want you to, first of all, see God's providence in everything. That's, that's step one. I want you to actually see it and identify it. And we, we look around the world and we see God's providence everywhere. We see it in the trees. We see it in the sunsets. We see it in the ocean. We see it in all the, the beautiful things here in our world. Psalm 19, verse 1 through 2 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above it proclaims his handiwork. God's, God's power is on display. God's character is on display everywhere. God is actively involved in everything. You go to school, they teach you the, the theory of evolution, and basically what they're trying to do is they're trying to wipe God off the page. 
They're trying to say, oh, this is all a mistake and therefore there's no accountability to God. And therefore, if everything's a mistake, then we can do whatever we want. But if God created the world and we can see all of these things and we say, oh, wow, God made it. We know that God is, is intricately involved in every day. He's not just the watchmaker that, that winds the watch up and, and lets it go. And so if you are a Christian, not only do you have to sit here and just notice God and say, oh, wow, those trees were not a mistake from evolution, but they're actually something that God made, something that God designed. It's not just something that you just sit here and say, oh, that's cool. But you have to make sure that you are someone that puts your trust in that God who made the trees, who, who made your heart beat, who, who is intricately involved in everything, working behind the scenes. You can write down Roman, or Hebrews chapter 10, Hebrews 10 verse 23. It says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. There's this aspect of faith and a Christian, they live a life of faith, putting their trust in that God. Not only do they see God in everything, not only do they see God in their life circumstances and the, the situations that you're in right now, you should be seeing God, you should be noticing God, but also you should be putting your, your faith in God. You see, the world, they like to use the words fate or luck or fortune or whatever. They use all of these words. And what they try to do with these words is basically they're taking God out of the picture. But if you're a Christian, you don't only see God in everything. You see him working in everything. But also you should, therefore, put your trust in him. And so I want you to think right now about your life. I want you to think right now about your situations at school. I want you to think right now about your situations with your family or maybe the, the crazy 2020 that just happened this year and you start to think through all of these things that are going on in your life. I want you to really think about God behind those things. Sometimes it's extremely obvious. Oh, God's working through this and I can totally see it. But I want you, when you don't see it, I want you to really think about those things. I want you to really think, why did this whole pandemic happen? What is God trying to teach me? What is God trying to show me? Sometimes you have to have that magnifying glass. Sometimes you have to be like those, those logos and look for, the, for, look for the little hidden messages, if you will, in those logos. If you, if you don't look very hard, you might completely miss it. Karina and I were watching the other day, The Amazing Race. I don't know why we like that show, but we like watching that show. And we were watching, uh, there, was this, there was this challenge where you had to dive under the water and go grab these things that were basically hidden behind these bubbles. And so people were having trouble seeing it. And there was this one girl that was there for hours and hours and hours because every time she went down, she didn't go deep enough and she didn't see these little things that she was supposed to take. And they had the cameras positioned in such a way that they showed the little thing that she was supposed to take and they showed her like swimming right next to it or like her feet were like bumping it. And it was just an interesting perspective to see, oh wow, she's so close. She could grab this little, I don't even know what it was, like a... Maybe it was like her golden ticket or something like, I don't know what it was, but she kept missing it and she kept swimming by it. She was so close to it, but she didn't grab onto it because she didn't see it. And we were sitting there watching a dumb show like that, like stressed about it, like, man, like just grab it. It's just right there. And I think that's you and that's me when, when we don't see God's providence in things. It's right there. If you look hard enough, if you put those goggles on, if you will, and you, you make sure that you're attentive to God's work in your life, you'll see it. Just like those logos, just like that girl in the Amazing Race, if you look, you will find it. And so God, he's working behind the scenes and he does that here in the book of Esther. God saves the Jews through Esther and through Mordecai. But look back at chapter 9. Look back at chapter 9. I want, I want you to look at verse 20. This is just after, this is just after the Jews were saved. They were delivered from their enemies. You read there in, the, in your ESV Bibles, maybe you see that little subtitle that says the Feast of Purim, inaugurated. So let's read here in verse 20. It says, Mordecai, he recorded all of these things, referring to basically this whole account of God saving the Jews. It says, you recorded all these things and he sent letters to all the Jews who were in all the providence of, of King Xerxes, both near and far, obligating them to keep the 14th day of the month of Adar and also the 15th day of the same year by year as the days on which the Jews got relief from their enemies and as the month that had, they had been turned for them from sorrow into gladness and from mourning into a holiday that they should make 
them days of feasting and gladness, days for sending gifts of food to one another and gifts to the poor. And it goes on to explain this feast in further detail. But there's this feast of Purim, and basically what they were, what this festival was was inaugurated for, was so that the people of Israel would be reminded of God's deliverance in the land of Persia, God's deliverance through this queen Esther and through Mordecai. And so what they did, we just read it year after year, they'd celebrate this, and they were trying to remind themselves of God's faithfulness in the past. They were trying to remind themselves of, hey, look, God saved us from basically a holocaust. Look at how faithful God is to us. So I want us to not miss out on that either. So write this down this way for point number two. Point out God's faithfulness. Point out God's faithfulness. Point out God's faithfulness. The Feast of Purim, Purim, it was just a reminder of God's deliverance. It was just a reminder of God's faithfulness. It, it, it was a couple days out of the year, two days out of the year, they would stop. They would say, wow, look at what God has done for us. Look at how God has saved us. If you think back to the atrocities of the Holocaust, we think of that as like the worst you know, thing that mankind has ever done, but the worst genocide ever, the Holocaust. Can you imagine how great it would be if you could go back in time and, and just snap your fingers and, and basically avoid this whole thing? And so we, we don't even know the word Holocaust because, because you went back and saved it. Can you imagine how thankful those, those Jewish people would be? That's, the, that, that's really what's going on here at the Feast of, Pur of Purim. This genocide could have happened. They were going to wipe every Jew off of the face of the earth, or at least in this in this region. But if you think back, we just talked about it, Genesis 12, God promising to Moses or promising to Abraham that he would bless him and bless his family. Basically, this this feast was was an anniversary. So every year on June third every year on june 3rd kareen and i we celebrate an anniversary of our wedding and that's a it's a great day i have to spend a lot of money on you know gifts and and you know dinner and stuff like that and that's all fine and good um but every year we we sit down and we say wow look at how awesome we look back at our wedding pictures or something like that we're like look at how awesome it was to get married and it's so awesome because we're we're still married Look how awesome it is that God has been so faithful to us. We're still together. We're, we still love each other. Everything is still going well. We're in the worst uh, county in the whole country of divorce rates. The, you know, Orange County is like 72% of marriages end in divorce or something like that. It's just insane numbers. But every anniversary, we're like, hey, this is awesome. We, we're, we're still together. We love each other. We're better than we ever have been before. And we celebrate this commitment that we made to each other a long time ago on our wedding day, and we said, I'm going to never leave you. I'm never going to forsake you. I'm going to be with you till the day I die. And our anniversary, it's such a big deal because we're still together. The Feast of Purim, it was the same thing. Hey, look at God's faithfulness, his commitment to us, his covenant with us. Let us worship him. Let us celebrate that. Look down at verse 27. I love this verse. Verse 27, Esther chapter 9, verse 27. It says the Jews, they firmly obligated themselves and their offsprings and all who joined them that they without fail would keep these two days according to what was written at that time appointed every year and that these days should be remembered and kept throughout every generation, every clan, province, and city that the days of Purim should never fall into disuse among the Jews nor should the commemoration of these days cease among their descendants. I love the way that it words it there in verse 27. The Jews firmly obligated themselves. They made this commitment to themselves that they would keep this holiday. They reminded themselves they were very intentional. And I think that's something that we can take away from this chapter here. We need to be intentional about reminding ourselves of God's faithfulness. Reminding ourselves, hey, look at how God has been faithful to me in my life. Look at how God has been faithful in Scripture. Look at how faithful God has been to me by saving me from my sins, forgiving my sins. God is the author of everything like we talked about. Your life is now designed to be for Him, for His glory. There's a couple practical ways that we can talk about how we can actually do that in real life. I think the first one, the most obvious one, is you can, you can be very intentional about, uh, about pointing out God's faithfulness in prayer. That's the first thing that I think you can do. 
pointing out God's faithfulness in prayer. Oftentimes we sit down to pray and we think, God, I, I want you to give me all of these things. Give me this, 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 this. Pray for that person, that sick person, that sick person. And then just help this person feel better. And Thanks, God. Have a good day. Like that's Our prayers typically look more like, give me, give me, give me. But the way that Jesus describes us to pray in Matthew chapter 6, he says the first thing he starts off with is, hallowed be your name. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. What he's doing there is he's recognizing God and how good he is and, and trying to praise God, trying to basically point out God's faithfulness, kind of like this, this feast here in Esther chapter 9. So the first way that you can do that is by praying and by thinking very specifically when you pray. I want to be making sure that I'm praising God for, for his faithfulness in my life. I want to make sure that I praise God for forgiving me of my sin. I, I want to make sure that I'm praising God for, for sending his son to live in my place and to die in my place. So the first way that you can do that, pointing out God's faithfulness, just like this, this feast of Purim, is prayer. The next thing you can do is, is worship. And I know that sounds kind of weird, but I want you to really think about how you worship on a Sunday morning when you come to church. We start singing songs. Is that the time where you check out? Is that the time when you start thinking about your voice? Is that the time when you're complaining about how bad the bassist sounds? Like, is that, is that what you do? Uh, hopefully not. Hopefully you don't have to. Is, is worship a time where you check out? Your mind is just thinking about other things. Because worship is designed for you to really think deeply about who God is. Really think deeply about God's faithfulness. Engaging your mind in worshiping God rather than engaging your mind in distractions or your voice or the band or your lyric sheet flopping around in the wind or how cold you are or what you're going to eat for lunch or is it a time where you're really focused and engaged in the words, in the lyrics? Hey man, I want, I want to make sure that I'm praising God. Another way that you can do this, another way you can point out God's faithfulness is just in your conversations with other people. I know we always have that joke that whenever Matt shows up to a conversation, it's time to change your conversation. Oh, Matt's coming. Oh, let's change my conversation. I know that you guys do that. And I know it's a joke. Well, kind of, I think. I, in a way, I know, there, there's a truth in every joke, but I, I, I know it's a joke. But I want you to think about your conversations with other people. Do you ever point out God's faithfulness to other people? I know that sounds like, oh, well, that's kind of a weird thing, like maybe in small groups or something like that. But I want you to think about just your everyday conversations, your random conversations. See, I can think, to, I can think now in, in my life, and I think about the times when I spend time with other people, maybe in my small group, maybe other like leaders here, and we start talking when we're not sitting in a small group, we start talking about how faithful God is. I'll tell you, those are some of the best times ever. Those are some of the best conversations I have. Because, hey, it's two people coming together saying, wow, look at how great God is. Doing exactly what we were designed to do. Point, and, and, and point our attention and our reflection to God. So I want you to think about how you can do that in conversations with other people, as awkward as it may seem. The last thing that I think you can do to point out God's faithfulness is with evangelism. We haven't talked about that for a little while, but you can point out God's faithfulness in evangelism. We we're just talking about conversations with others, and by others I mean with each other. But what are you talking about at school? What are you talking about at your sports practice when it's legal? What, what, what are you doing when you're with other people who don't go to church, who don't know God? You can be pointing out God's faithfulness in those situations, in those conversations, in those relationships. And hey, look at what God has done for you. Look, God sent his only son to live in your place, to die on the cross for your sins, so that you can be made right with God. See, we look around this, this, this pregnancy table area, and you think, I know a lot of you guys brought a lot of friends to the Halloween party. You brought a lot of friends to the uh, Christmas party. And that's all great. And I'm so, th those events were so great and so awesome. But where are they now? Are you still inviting them? Or is that just, oh, well, if we're going to do a Christmas party or we're going to give you a free pair of Beats or Vans gift card, that's when I'll invite my friends. You see, evangelism is sharing the gospel with other people and saying, hey, come, come with me. Come, come with me to normal small groups, not just when I can get a pair of Beats by you coming and showing up. But, hey, I, I want you to know more about God. I want you to dig in to God's word with me because I love this God. I want you to love this God with me. This festival here in Esther chapter 9 is all about pointing out God's faithfulness and remembering all the th great things that God has done. 
something that we need to be doing. And the greatest thing God has ever done to display his love, his care, his providence coming into to, to, to space and time and the creation to show you that he cares for you and that he loves you is through the cross. If you are reading every, every day with us in our, in our daily Bible reading, we just read the story in Matthew chapter 27 today about Jesus dying on the cross. We just read about Jesus literally breathing his last, being made fun of, being mocked, being hung on a, a piece of wood so that you could go free, so that your friends at school can go free. Everyone who puts their faith and trust in, in that sacrifice can go free. But I know some of you here are still waiting. You never have put your trust in Jesus. You still don't really put your, your faith in the providence of God coming into space and time, caring and loving you. And see, that's what the, one of the most foolish things that you can possibly do. The cross is a beautiful picture of God's providence. Don't look at God's providence in the face and ignore it. Don't look at God's providence in the face and say, I don't need it. Don't look at God's providence in the face and turn a blind eye to it and say, ah, maybe another day, maybe when I get older, maybe when I go to college, maybe when I get married, maybe when I have kids, maybe I'll really become a Christian at that point in time. This is not something that you wait on. This is not something you say, hey God, thanks for your providence, but I'll catch you later. God's providence is his love and his care for you. Esther is all about God providing and caring for his people. God has cared and he has provided for you through the cross of Jesus Christ. And I hope and I pray that you would be made right with God because he does love you. He does care for you so much. He sent his son to show you how much he does love and care for you. And I'd love for you to get, I'd love for you to be made right with that God tonight if you never have before. So let's bow our heads and let us pray together right now. God, we are just overwhelmed with your goodness to us. We're overwhelmed with uh, just your, your love and your care for us as sinners. God, if you see your, your kindness and your faithfulness in the book of Esther to your people, God, we know that this is not just something, not just a story that we read in the Old Testament, but this is something that you're actively doing today. Though we look around at our world and we see all of these terrible things go on, God, we know that you're still at work. We know that you're still involved. We know that you're still faithful and that you still love us. And God, I pray that you would remind each and every student of that here tonight. God, you would allow us to not just recognize your providence and rec recognize your care and your love for, for your people, but also that we would put our faith in you, that that providence would allow us to trust you even in the most difficult days of our life. God, we love you and we're just thankful for this great reminder here today. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.